The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everybody. My name is John Mayer. I'm the Executive Director of CALI, the Center for Computer-Assisted Legal Instruction. And welcome to week four of Topics in Digital Law Practice. This week, we're covering a topic called Unbundling Legal Service Delivery. And, and I got to say, I think this is the meat and potatoes or the, or the bones of digital law practice. Um, and our speaker this week is, uh, is I mean, we almost couldn't have found a better speaker. Um, it, it, he's, he's awesome. Um, but let me uh, handle some uh, housekeeping and we'll get to, uh, we'll get the Richard granted. So here's a picture of me, a fairly recent one, uh, so that I'm not just a disembodied voice. I want to remind folks that uh, we haven't arranged for any Sealy credit uh, for uh, this course. Um, uh, I understand that there are some states that allow you to uh, self-report uh, Sealy credit, but that doesn't have anything to do with anything that we do. I just wanted to remind you because we keep on getting questions about that. The goals, if you all remember, of this course are to give students, you know, up-to-date information about modern 21st century law practice. We think that's a, a valuable thing. We want to inform law faculty. There's, there are quite a few faculty who are following along on this course. We want to inform them about the changing nature of law practice so that it informs their teaching. Um, and we want to, as a sort of a, not just a side benefit, but an ongoing benefit, uh, create an enduring resource that we can build on for future versions of this course. And the solution we've come up to reach those goals is this course, which is also a MOOC, a massive online open course. There are now over 800 people registered for the course. Not all of you are showing up for the live versions. We know lots of you are uh, catching the course afterwards. Um, a smaller number are doing the homeworks, and, and I want to take this opportunity to say thank you for doing that. Um, for those of you who aren't doing the homeworks, you're missing out. A lot of the benefit is, as, is actually doing some of the work in those homeworks because they give you experience in, in the topics that are specifically covered in the lecture. Um, it, at the very least, if you don't do the homeworks, Take a look at what the other students have done. That's why we're doing it in this open way, so that you can benefit from the work that other people have done. So the homework wiki is at tdlp.wikispaces.com. These are the three badges that uh, are currently available, and this is the reveal for the fourth badge for this week's course. You'll notice that uh, Austin Greathouse, our uh, wonderful producer, has that come up with badges that are that actually have relevant icons for the topic. That first one was virtual law practice. The TDLPH2 is for document automation. You see there's like a clipboard. The third one was for tech in the courts, and there's a courthouse. And so this is for unbundled legal services, legal service delivery. As always, if you have questions, post them into the question box. We will ask them of the speaker in the in a few minutes after we've got after his presentation. And those that we don't have time to ask, we, uh, we dump to the wiki and then answer them, uh, or ask the speaker to answer them. Let me uh, go over to that and show you that last week's uh, speaker, Jim McMillan, did come, come through and uh, posted a, a whole bunch of answers to all of the questions that we didn't get to. I went through after that and added links for some of the things that he talked about. Uh, this is a great sort of FAQ on, on some of the topics. I uh, really appreciate uh, Jim doing that for us. So this week is week four, and our speaker is Richard Granite. Here's a picture of Richard. Um, thanks for coming, Richard. And Richard is, um, it, it's almost too much to talk about here, Richard. Um, uh, he's the co-chair of the e Loring Task Force of the Law Practice Management Section. Um, he's been involved in developing innovative legal services for over 30 years, you know, first as part of the group that created the National Legal Services Program, and later as the director of the Center for Legal Studies at Antioch Law School in Washington. Um, he created the first virtual law firm in Maryland in 2003, which was a prototype for direct law, virtual law platform. He was a legal rebel, as named by the American Bar Association Journal in 2009 and he was awarded the Lewis M. Brown Lifetime Achievement Award for Innovation in the Delivery of Legal Services in 2010. He's a graduate of Columbia University, 
and we are delighted to have them. And then, and I will ask now Austin to uh, switch over to his screen. Uh, great, John. Thank you very much for that. Uh, let me just get in. Uh, Well, you should be seeing the uh, the initial slide uh, since you sent it to me. So, well, that's good. All right. So, we're going to give a little bit of an overview about what we're going to talk about in this session. First, I'm going to talk about defining what we mean by unbundled legal services. And I'm going to talk about the ethics rules and how the ethics rules apply to this new environment. And then I'm going to talk about what I call the new normal, how changing consumer expectations really change the way in which you design your law practice and think about delivering legal services. The fourth, I'm going to talk about specifically the impact of the Internet as a platform for the delivery of legal services. Even though this topic of unbundled legal services can be done in the office, it has special power when you think about delivering it online as, a, uh, as an approach to uh, really connecting uh, with clients. Uh, there's a special power that uh, takes this concept from where it was originally conceived, and when you put it online, it begins to achieve leverage that uh, are really, uh, are remar I think, remarkable. Then I'm going to go through some case studies, some nuts and bolts, so you can think about if some of you who are graduating law school and you're beginning to think about uh, maybe going out on your own, and uh, the, this will inform your business planning process. And I'm going to talk about the future for this concept and really how to learn more, because uh, learning really does start, I believe, when you get out of law school. I don't think you learn much in law school about these ideas, as I mentioned as I go through the presentation. So when we talk about unbundled legal services, what do we really mean? Well, it's not really rocket science. It really, what we're really talking about doing is breaking down a complete legal matter into discrete tasks. And rather than the client purchasing uh, a, a broad retainer uh, where the lawyer takes care of everything, they just purchase the discrete legal tasks that they actually need. And then they take responsibility for doing some other things themselves. And I'll show you some examples of what I really mean by that. That's why this, is some, this concept is often called discrete task representation or limited legal services. It's not just that uh, we, we don't have just one term of unbundled legal services. The founder of this movement is, is a fellow by the name of Woody Mostyn, who really creates this idea pre-internet. But his in initial insight was use your lawyer only for what your lawyer can do for you. And that has lots of implications in terms of cost and in terms of modeling legal services and how legal services are really actually delivered. Wikipedia, believe it or not, has a definition of uh, unbundled legal services, which I found. And uh, it defines it as a method of legal services in the United States in which an attorney and client agree to limit the scope of the attorney's involvement in a lawsuit or other legal action, leaving responsibilities for just those aspects of the case uh, uh, basically to the client. Uh, I want to try and remove that, uh, that dialogue on the left because it's, uh, okay, we'll, we'll leave it the way it is. Uh, uh, the, um, the PowerPoint's not moving forward for some reason. Let me try and do this again. Here we go. Okay, so I like to think of legal services, uh, unbundled legal services, kind of legal services a la carte, like one from column A and one from column B. It's a way of thinking about slicing and dicing legal services, which has an impact of really reducing the cost to the client. Therefore, as I will explain as this uh, uh, presentation goes forward, we really widen access to legal services and we widen the market for legal services because we, we've come up with a, a way of actually reducing the price by using uh, the client to do part of the work themselves. Let's start with ethics. Uh, ethics really, uh, the ethical rules are what really makes us a profession, but uh, sometimes those ethical rules can strangulate uh, the development of innovation uh, of uh, the delivery of legal services. I'm not going to talk too much about the strangulation because you have another instructor in this course, Will Hornsby, who's really an expert in this, and he can talk more to the point about how the ethical rules sometimes impede innovation uh, within the delivery of legal services. Nevertheless, we really need to understand what the ground rules are because for a long period of time, 
this idea of delivering legal, limited legal services was an anathema within the legal profession. The lawyer really had to take responsibility for the whole job and leave nothing to the client. It's only recently that we've had an innovation in the rules themselves, which really permit this in a way so that the lawyer doesn't have uh, exposure to real liability. So the, the, key, the key new rule that was really passed uh, uh, several years ago is, is uh, uh, 1.2c, which says that a lawyer may limit the scope of representation if the limitation is reasonable under the circumstances and the client really gives informed consent. Now, those are two general standards which uh, in the implementation can be a little bit tricky, but it is the ground rule and the basis for delivering pieces of legal services rather than the whole legal service. This rule has actually been adopted by 41 states, and the remaining states have adopted a similar rule, and a committee which I'm involved in, which is the, the Delivery uh, Legal Services Committee within the American Bar Association, has a proposal that's going before the American Bar Association in the annual meeting, which uh, asked the House of Delegates to really endorse this concept uh, in a way that uh, is really positive. So lawyers begin to think uh, uh, very carefully and expansively and positively about this uh, limited legal service concept. So let's talk about how we implement the practices because when we talk about best practices, in order to really limit the, one's liability, there's certain basic ideas that you really have to adhere to. The first one is there needs to be some kind of a written agreement. If you don't have a written agreement as a law firm or as a lawyer, you really you're exposing yourself uh, to liability. And this written agreement needs to be limited into time and scope. It says when the engagement starts and when the engagement actually ends. Ideally, if you have a refund policy or a guarantee policy, it needs to be in this written agreement. It needs to describe the specific task that you're really doing for the client. So the, the, this is a new kind of retainer agreement. It's not a general retainer agreement. It's a limited services retainer agreement. It, what it does, it really it defines the scope of representation. Uh, I actually have a sample that uh, if you click through when this goes up online, you'll be able to see a sample limited retainer agreement. Uh, um, you know, we, and we work with lots of law firms, and we insist that every one of these law firms at the time that a client registers online, they accept uh, essentially a limited retainer agreement. Uh, there are some other issues here. Uh, sometimes uh, on certain kinds of cases, uh, if you don't have a written agreement that's limiting the scope of representation, the court will rule that the client, that the lawyer really has to enter an appearance, for example, in a Chapter 7 bankruptcy. Uh, this, of course, if it's unanticipated, increases uh, the, uh, dramatically the cost of the entire engagement. So, uh, as part of the agreement, you really have to specify uh, whether entry of a, whether uh, the lawyer is going to do any entry of appearances, and also when uh, uh, when the limited legal services uh, engagement actually ends. Uh, so. If we to summarize this, I'm going to summarize this and then just go through like three or four major points. Uh, I think you know the first one is there is a variation in your state bar rules, so you have to uh, check and see what is required by your local bar. You have to define what's reasonable under the circumstances. You have to clarify the scope of representation. Uh, if you turn somebody away, you should do a rejection letter in writing. At the end of the relationship, there should be a letter ending the client relationship. You still should really check for client for conflicts of interest. So what these are, these are essentially design elements dictated by the ethical rules when you are creating a new form of legal service. Whether that service is offered online or it's offered in your office yourself, because these concepts apply both in the office as well as uh, in the online environment. Now we can talk about some examples of among the legal services. And here's where creativity really comes into play. Here's a partial list. Reviewing, just reviewing a document for a client. Reviewing documents bundled with legal advice, enabling the client to go off and file the documents by themselves or maybe do actually represent themselves in the hearing, but all you're doing as a lawyer is bundling the documents with legal advice. This is the core of the, my own particular practice uh, that, uh, uh, that I practice in, this, in Maryland. 
uh, drafting an individual order, just negotiating for the client, preparing exhibits, what we call court coaching. The client's going to go into small claims court, and they want to buy some of your advice about what they need to say, what the, how to frame their claim, how to, how to argue their claim to the other side. So we create a new service called court coaching. Ghostwriting is when you actually write a brief on behalf of the client, and some states require that if a lawyer is used to write a brief for a client, that the identity of the lawyer must be uh, disclosed in the document. But that's not true of every state. So again, you really have to uh, check your state rules. Uh, lawyers are giving legal advice by telephone or by email. They're just slicing and dicing that uh, so that uh, they're giving limited legal advice. Uh, lawyers are advising, obviously, clients about legal rights. They're doing what we call legal form preparation, which is legal services that are delivered for a fixed price or they'll do particular legal research and only around a, uh, an individual issue. So we have these four basic rules that limita limitations must be informed and that the, the client must understand what they're really getting into. It must be reasonable under the circumstances. If you have a client who's really going to be challenged by this kind of thing and really doesn't understand what you're talking to, uh, talking about, then you, it's really a case for uh, full service representation not uh, limited representation. If you have a, a, a case which is going to be filled with conflicts, then it's a, it's a case for uh, full service representation, not limited representation. Uh, any change in the scope of the engagement needs to be documented. Uh, clients must be advised on related issues, even if they don't ask. There was a famous case in California where a lawyer lost a malpractice suit because the client came in with a workman's compensation case and he wasn't advised that there was a related civil case against the bus company that uh, hit him and then the statute of limitations uh, expired and even though the office said on the uh, on the door that our practice is limited to workman's compensation cases it was ruled that the lawyer really needed to advise the client of any kind of other related claims after all, it's the lawyer who knows about related claims, not the client. So, in, in that in that way, you, you really have to be you have to be careful. So, it's not as if uh, every situation can be handled with total simplicity. There is complexity in doing this, but I think you can provide for uh, dealing with the complexity and reducing your liability if you're really careful. Now. I'm not going to switch for a bit, and I'm going to talk about why this trend is really accelerating, what's really happening in the marketplace, which uh, suggests that uh, now is the time to deliver le limited legal services. Why I believe that limited legal services, run by the legal services, will continue to become a dominant way in which legal services are delivered to the, to the average consumer. And we're talking about really individuals and small business. We're not necessarily talking about uh, large corporate law firms that deal with large corporate clients, but even in that environment, we see a form of unbundling uh, begin to take place. So what's, what's happening in terms of what, cons what do consumers really want from their lawyers? And, and these are the things that I believe that anybody who's planning a law firm today really needs to take into account that consumer behavior is shifting and consumers have much higher expectations about what they want from their lawyers. So what do clients really want? Clients want fixed pricing. We know that. Now, not every legal matter can be uh, delivered on a fixed price. But if it can be, clients really want fixed pricing. Clients want speed. They want something yesterday. Uh, clients, because of the Internet and because of the way in which the Internet uh, is shaping consumer behavior, uh, I just saw a statistic this morning that if a website doesn't load in something like uh, uh, you know, 100 milliseconds, the person's off to another website. So everybody has an expectation of speed. Uh, clients want more transparency, meaning that they really want clarity in terms of what they're paying for in terms of their legal services. If you're doing uh, work for them, they really want to know what goes into the work and how the work really gets done. So law firms that know how to practice transparency, I believe, will be winners in terms of gaining clients in the future. Clients want better technology. I mean, after all, I mean, uh, clients do their banking online, they do their travel online, they do their brokerage online. Why can't they really deal with their lawyers online? They know that that technology is out there. You heard Mark Lawrence and talk about the efficiency of using document automation. Yet even today, many law firms uh, still don't do that. They're still operating in what I call uh, really a generation ago. And, 
And clients really expect you to find that technology, use that technology, and pass the benefits to them in terms of reduc a reduction in price. All these trends now become accelerated because we have a web generation which is uh, evolving to the point where uh, they all have legal problems. And as a web generation which has essentially in the, internet, in the DNA, it's your generation, people who are texting all the time, they really expect their lawyers to be available online and be available in a way uh, that is responsive to how they perceive they really want to purchase legal services. At the same time that this is happening, we see lots of competition, and the competition is really coming from uh, non-loyal law firms. And we have uh, something like a legal zoom that's done a million wills. I'm sure everybody's heard of legal zoom unless you've been sleeping for the last couple of years. Legal zoom, by the way, says that they uh, generated 100 million dollars in revenue last year and is about to file for an IPO. This is not a law firm, and it's the major legal brand in America, and it's not even a law firm. The significance of this is that what LegalZoom has done is that they've unbundled the lawyer completely out of the process. They've taken unbundled to, to an extreme by simply uh, providing forms with a paralegal review. So that's a form. All of these uh, uh, new uh, disruptive efforts are a form of unbundling. And the legal profession is really yet to catch up uh, with this uh, kind of demand and, with, and this kind of an environment. Meanwhile, I believe there's a huge latent market. There's a huge demand for access to the justice system. We have uh, uh, you know, millions of people who really can't afford the full price of going to a lawyer. And I believe that it is possible to tap into this latent market by being creative and by creating essentially new kinds of services that uh, can reach out to people at the point uh, where they feel comfortable uh, both uh, essentially connecting uh, at a price point which makes sense for them. So this is a screen for LegalZoom. LegalZoom has become one of the major trademarking services uh, in the United States today. And if you look at the screen carefully, it's really a form of unbundling even though it's not a law firm. It's fixed pricing. It's a very specific service that they're providing. And, and in a way, this becomes a model for what law firms could actually uh, uh, evolve to in terms of serving solos and, uh, well, in terms of serving the average consumer in small business. Uh, this is a new site, which is kind of interesting to me, that was just developed by Lexis. It's, it's easylaw.com. And here what they've done is they've connected up a document assembly solution with legal advice from an attorney. So again, this is a form of unbundling because they're offering a stripped down legal service at, for essentially for a fixed price for those people that it fits. It doesn't necessarily fit for the most complex matters, but it certainly fits for these kinds of matters. I also kind of find it interesting that Lexis, who views their clients as on the side uh, as law firms, are uh, essentially disintermediating their primary clients by offering a direct consumer service. It's a site that's really worth take, uh, taking a look at. Uh, and, and if you wanted to actually do an exercise, you can evaluate it to see whether it's truly ethical compliant. And I suppose it is because it's Lexis, but sometimes uh, the biggest play is on the block. Uh, may overlook certain things. Here's another example of unbundling. This is a site called Law Pivot, where lawyers give legal advice in bits. Uh, some of it is free and some of it uh, you pay for. It's called crowdsource legal advice for businesses. So where are we in terms of the legal profession? It's a remarkable to me that only 52% of solos act even have a website. So it's really hard to deliver unbundled legal services over the internet unless you even have a website, which is really the gateway to uh, connecting with a lawyer online. Uh, when I do my analysis, and I've seen other research in this, we would say that the legal profession is lagging behind every other service industry in terms of its capacity to connect with consumers around the dimensions that I went through in the last, in the last few slides. Uh, they're also further behind every other service industry in the u contemporary use of Internet technology to connect and relate to clients. So now let me shift a little bit. I want to go through what I call some case studies and talk about the, the concept of what I call friction. Uh, a way of thinking about uh, responsive legal services is to think about reducing friction. Friction really means that you can connect easily with your lawyer and get things done with your lawyer without a lot of complexity. Uh, the ethical rules are a source of friction 
because it makes it more complicated for a law firm to deliver legal services in an unbundled way than, it, than something like a legal zoo who doesn't have to comply with those rules. But sometimes having a certain amount of friction is good because it really protects uh, the interest of the consumer. So when you think about balancing, there's a balance between something which is completely unfettered and uh, unregulated and something like a legal service delivered by a legal uh, by a law firm which has a certain amount of friction attached to it but still retains uh, what I call uh, the integrity of core professional values uh, and really represents the core values that as a profession we represent. When we design models to service this new and growing market we need to think about what we call the economic benefits so what, is, what are some of the real benefits of this approach? First, the, mar uh, the market is expanded because the price is reduced. It enables a lawyer to actually develop a limited relationship and build some trust with a client so that the client can come back to you at some later point when they have a more complex and uh, engaging kind of a problem for a more full-service representation. By reaching out to a client and doing a small piece of work, is one pathway to building trust. Uh, finally, uh, I believe that uh, one of the pure economic benefits for a law firm in offering limited legal services is that it generates revenue. It generates revenue which is now being lost to something like the legal zooms and the other non-law firms that are offering simply legal forms without the benefit of legal advice and legal guidance. Law firms are leaving revenue on the table in the millions by not really adopting this approach of offering limited legal services. Another thought is that we know that this approach helps really meet the needs of clients as the client perceives their need. By offering a range of different kinds of services, you can diversify your clientele and reach out to clients who normally uh, you might overlook or you or simply would uh, uh, not be connected to your law practice. So there are benefits to this unbundling approach. A key one which is driving change and the reason for the change in the rules is that we know that uh, by offering even bits of legal services it lessens the burden on the court system because the court system today is now overwhelmed by people who are essentially representing themselves, something like in uh, family law cases, 90% of, of all family court, uh, law cases, one party is representing themselves. By adding a, a little bit of legal guidance, you reduce uncertainty and you reduce the amount of disinformation and miseducation that clients bring into the courthouse. At the same time, there's a much greater access to the legal system for individuals who simply can't afford $150 or $200 an hour with no upper limit. Uh, for the professionals, uh, as I've indicated, this taps into a different kind of a client base and taps into what we call this latent market for a uh, an online legal services. So let me just skip over this for a minute. The concept of unbundled uh, legal services really starts out in an office environment before the Internet was really a, uh, per the pervasive platform it is today. But when you add digital technology, you increase the reach of the law firm and you're able to create new legal service products that don't really exist in an offline environment and which can be offered, for example, by a law firm statewide. Uh, and uh, you, you, can, uh, you can create all sorts of new competitive alternatives which are offered and powered by essentially online technologies. There's something also about digital technology that it forces the breakdown of services into smaller units of consumption. It, 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 there's something about the digital technology itself which has an impact on, on what, what I call not only service delivery but also on media. So in the same way, iTunes really broke up the mu music industry by uh, destroying the concept of the purchase of the album. So you could purchase an individual song on iTunes for 99 cents. 
digital technology is having the same impact of forcing lawyers to develop discrete and narrow services that can be offered over a much wider geographical area. And the Internet really supports that distribution because when, if you're going to be on Google and you expect to be found on Google as a law firm, you need to have a very narrow and specific focus. The narrower the focus that you have, the easier it is to be found using organic search methods. So even though that is not what I call your total practice, the way in which to get the attention of the consumer is to have a very narrow focus. So I, for example, have a landing page for my family law practice, which just discusses what are called quadro orders, which are quadro, uh, qualified domestic relations orders in the divorce. That's a very narrow product that I price very specifically. And because it's narrow, it gets a lot of mind space on, on the Internet. So what's happened is that digital technology itself breaks down this concept of the general retainer for general legal services into new kinds of service products that can be uh, easily delivered. So when it's done right, you get what I call great leverage. When you invest in developing a new digital service, you can end up with uh, a very powerful, highly leveraged, high margin service that you can deliver to many, many more people than you can deliver individually. So now let me uh, focus on some case studies. Uh, some of these URLs you've seen, some of you haven't. I've already discussed LegalZoom. Uh, a case study that I want to uh, uh, mention is actually I'm going to use my own law practice. You can find it at mdfamilylawyer.com. I have another site called granitewills.com. In my family law practice, I have taken all the services that I do and I break them down into individual bits. Like, for example, if you can't find your spouse to serve your spouse, that's called a motion for alternative service. Uh, I created a separate service just to do that because the average consumer doesn't know how to do motion for alternative service. Uh, in m most of my practice, uh, the client actually goes to the hearing themselves with my coaching support. Therefore, they don't have to pay me to go to the hearing. They file their documents themselves. They don't have to pay me to file their documents. So what I'm doing is providing what I call the core legal services, which is done essentially for a fixed price. So this is what my site looks like. and it, it, it's, a, it's a partial screenshot, but if you, if you went to the site itself, I think you'd find uh, as a good example of what we call uh, unbundled legal services over the net. There are products on the left-hand side. Each of these products I sell for a fixed price bundled with legal advice. In this case, the, uh, uh, the, the, the discussions that you had about the virtual law firm and document automation that Mark Lauritsen talked about two weeks ago also come into play because all these technologies uh, get integrated in the delivery of unbundled legal services. So there is a connection between all the sessions that we are now having in the sense that they're building blocks to creating the business plan for, for a law practice that I think will really thrive and expand uh, in, the, in the next two decades. Uh, so if you examine this and you, you click on legal services and go to the site itself, uh, you'll see a whole variety of what I call unbundled legal service products and uh, uh, this is a purely virtual law firm. I actually don't see clients. If I have clients in this divorce practice who need more complex work, I simply refer them out to other lawyers who have a more traditional practice because for a variety of reasons, it's not something that I want to handle directly. Uh, to, uh, this is a little bit of a workflow. When, when a person uh, signs on, they have to register. At the point of registration, they accept this limited retainer agreement. And I actually do a conflicts check. So this registration process is ethically compliant with the rules which I described in the beginning of the session. When the client actually gets admitted to our, their individual client space, the client has a secure space, and this is the virtual law firm concept that Stephanie Kimbrough spoke about so eloquently in the first session. And this client space shows individual services that can be purchased. And on the top tabs, that every one of those tabs really describes a kind of unbundled legal service. Like I do court coaching. I do legal document review, which means that the client gets a document from an opposing party and wants me to review it and advise them on their legal rights. They upload it into this space. I review it and I tell them what price I'm gonna charge for it. And uh, then I make my comments and I can communicate with them through essentially a, 
a communications tab. And what's happening in all this is that even though my prices are low, I'm doing a more volume business. And because my costs are very low, my margins are much higher. So we're dealing here with a different model where we have integrated the concepts of, in this case, document automation and a virtual law firm into the idea of delivering unbundled legal services. This is another site that I run that's just in the wills area. And as you'll notice that uh, 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 th these are narrowly focused sites because I don't believe that if you have a general practice law firm, you're, you're able to really get the kind of penetration that you really need within the search engines unless you spend a fortune with Google using pay for click. And again, you can see that process on the right. You register, you complete your forms, uh, I review them and I get back to you. This is another site that offers unbundled legal services, flat fees and justice for all of that. It's a Florida law firm. They offer their legal services on a 24-7 basis, a very creative and uh, approach to the marketplace. I know this lawyer is really doing well with this site. So now let's talk a little bit about what I call design techniques. As a process of thinking through a business plan for your law firm, the first thing, of course, I believe you should do is to decide on a legal practice area that you have some passion about and want to uh, connect with uh, clients about. Once you've decided on the substantive area that you really want to work in, where you feel that there's potential, you begin to go through this other process. Instead of saying, oh, I'll just hold myself out and offer general legal services and people come in and sign a normal retainer agreement, let's see if I can offer Let's see if I can offer limited legal services as a way of beginning to build my practice, as a way of connecting with clients and building some trust. And the first thing you have to do is analyze legal projects into their component tasks. You have to have a skill to figure out of any kind of a major legal project, is there something that the client can do and only that I can do? Is there some value that I can bring to it which is really unique? Sometimes you can unbundle a project by issue. Sometimes a task becomes a project that you, uh, that you can break out separately. Uh, but what you want to be able to do is to carve a boundary around it. And then also, if you're really creative, think how you can digitize it, make it into a digital application, and then deliver it online. Now, the best example for that would be using what we call web-enabled document automation, where a person fills out an online questionnaire uh, uh, as soon as they press the submit button because we're using that web-enabled document automation. The document is instantly created, but the client doesn't know that. And then uh, essentially the lawyer has a first draft that can be reviewed, uh, that can be amended, and, uh, and legal advice can be given. And then from that you generate your, your final draft and give instructions back to the client on what to do next, like to execute a will or file a document in a court. So individual documents bundled with legal advice is the easiest way of understanding uh, what a limited legal service uh, can be like. Um, I mean, just slip for a minute. So this is a little chart of workflow that goes from registration to questionnaire to purchase of documents and to attorney review. So you want to begin to think about not only breaking out the task, but what you have to do some system design. What's the workflow going to be like? Uh, is, it, is it possible to, to use a paralegal for some of the work rather than, than the lawyer? So, for example, in all the work that I do, I have a paralegal do a lot of the basic work. And then I actually manage my virtual law firm at a distance because uh, the technology really uh, permits that to happen. So then what, once you've actually designed that, you have to think about pricing. Can you price actually higher for convenience, which is an interesting way of pricing. If you can deliver something which has less friction, and which has ease of use, maybe you can charge a premium for that. I'm not suggesting you do, but it's just an idea. You have to look at competitive pricing on the Internet. Uh, what do lawyers charge for similar kinds of servicing? Uh, so you have to inform your design of your business plan with some notion of pricing. Because if you, if you can't get the pricing right, you're going to lose money. And if you can't get the pricing right, you're not going to get enough clients. So there's a new uh, website out that most, most people don't know about called attorneyfee.com. It's a very creative website created by a couple of lawyers in San Francisco that have gone out to the net and grabbed price data on almost every kind of consumer legal service. So if you want to know what uh, lawyers are charging for an uncontested divorce in San Francisco, you can do a search on this and you will get a number. So that gives you some pricing boundaries uh, for the purposes of actually determining pricing. 
So what we're really dealing with in this last couple of slides is what I call system design, carving out a legal service, figuring out what I can do and what the client can do. Figuring out is there a way to make this into a digital application in part? How can I use technology to make this into uh, a very efficient way of me delivering a legal service? Because if I can do that, I have a real competitive advantage over my other lawyers. And what this is about in the industry, which is now overcrowded, is figuring out ways to get competitive advantage and to get the attention of, of clients. So when I think about the future of unbundling, I believe that fixed price legal service delivered online will become a dominant patent, particularly for consumers and small business. I believe that most law firms who are serving consumers and small business will have to move from just being passive law firm sites to interactive virtual law firms and uh, incorporate this client portal concept uh, that Stephanie Kimbrough worked, uh, discussed because it is within this concept I mean, what is delivered from the virtual law firm platform? It is unbundled legal services, and, that, and that's how essentially how, uh, how they are connected. Now, these trends are going to be pressured by continued acceleration and changes in consumer behavior by companies like LegalZoom who are not going away. So those companies, which are non-law firms, are really setting the patent for the way in which consumers purchase legal services. So to catch up, lawyers have to figure out a way to compete on this playing field. And you can, because there's only lawyers that can give legal advice. It's only lawyers that can give true legal guidance and do true legal work. So if you figure out a way to, uh, to deliver what I call a value-added service at a price competitive, uh, at a price which is really competitive, I believe you have a winning service if you can figure out how to market it and then figure out ways to really connect with uh, consumers. But if you don't have that, you're going to continue to lose market share to other forms of disruptive entities which are pursuing these kinds of stra uh, pricing and service delivery strategies uh, either with a lawyer or with a lawyer only in part. So this is a big subject. This is only, we only like touch the surface on that. Stephanie Kimbrough, who offered, who uh, uh, did the first session on virtual law firms, is actually coming out with a new book. And what I'm talking about here are ways to learn more. The book is called Serving the DUI Client, A Guide to Unbundling Legal Service for the Practitioner. It's actually being uh, published this month and will be out at the end of March in time for the ABA Legal Tech Show. I think it's really uh, mandatory reading for anybody who really wants to think about uh, issues in this space. Uh, there's a virtual online community called Virtual Law Connect, which consists of lawyers who are thinking about how to deliver legal services online, and it has uh, information in every single state about what the rules are on delivering unbundled legal services. Our own little company, Direct Law, has its own learning center, which expands on these themes. There is an, an entity which you may not have heard about called Solo Practice University which is an online paid uh, service. I think the price is like $117 a quarter, but during that quarter, you can get every single course that they offer. I actually offered a course in the legal services through this university, and what I'm telling you today is only a piece of a much longer eight to nine session course. But that's a very good resource. I mean, Solo Practice University, in a way, is designed to uh, offer uh, information and materials that you really don't get in law school. So as I say, your learning really first starts, I believe, when you graduate. There are a few courses like this which really touch on these subjects, which have become so critical to thinking about how to build your business plan for a law firm that's going to operate effectively uh, in the next decade. There are additional uh, resources. The ABA maintains its own unbundling resource center which is a single best repository of information about this concept. There's an older manual that was done by Mike Millman from University of Maryland Law School, which is the Handbook on Limited Scope Representation that was done for the ABA section on litigation. And I think that is uh, probably one of the best things that's ever been written on this. Uh, we have material on our own website. I co-chair what is called the e-lawyering task force of the American Bar Association's Law Practice Management section, which is one of is the only place in the ABA which helps lawyers 
learn about uh, how to respond to these challenges which are now uh, evolving uh, and uh, being uh, almost accelerating because of the impact of the internet that are challenging lawyers to think about new ways of delivering legal services. So we have guidelines on our website about how lawyers need to respond to cloud computing and what are the guidelines and best practices for delivering unbundled legal services online. Okay, so that is the end of this more formal presentation, and I'm now ready for questions. We have about 10 minutes to go if we have some questions. Great. <clears throat> you, want to, you want to take it back? Or yes. Okay. Richard, that was, that, you blew my mind. Thank you. That was, that was mind blowing. I, let, let me say right now, I think it's mandatory. I think it, I'm going to do everything I can so that every law student in the country sees this presentation. I think it's almost required that every law student get a clue about the, the future that this represents. And, 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 I, and I can't tell you how, how much, uh, how wonderful it was to have you uh, do that. That, that, was, that was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you. So, so I was typing uh, questions into this as well, and we got a, we got a few questions from the audience. Um, and I, know, I doubt we'll get to all of them, but um, let me just uh, work through this list. So how can you tell when something is all right to unbundle and something is like not good for unbundling? Well, I think you have to, you have to uh, first of all, you don't leave it to the client. But you do it on the system design side. You try and design something which is a discrete service, which has some boundaries to it. And then uh, you do take responsibility for uh, pursuing that piece of legal work. A good example that I gave, you know, when we do a lot of divorce work and we have a certain percentage can't find the other spouse so you, uh, to serve process. Mm -hmm. And in order to serve process, you have to go before the court and you have to do, uh, uh, you have to provide documentation uh, that you couldn't find the other spouse and it requires a separate motion. So uh, clients have a, sometimes a difficult time uh, providing sufficient documentation the court will approve. So that's an example, a very bounded task, which I alluded to in the presentation, which the lawyer does. And the lawyer does that whole task completely. And once it's done and you get the motion, then uh, in many cases the client can proceed with an uncontested divorce, which is a separate second task. In that case, uh, if it's an uncontested divorce and it's a no-fault divorce, uh, the hearing is very simple. There's no conflict. All they need is the forms and some legal advice. And when that's done, it becomes an administrative proceeding. So, so you have to be able to sharply delineate the nature of the task. It's really a design issue. And I'm interested in people's ideas about this because I think this is where fertile imagination comes yes. into play by lawyer entrepreneurs in seeing ways to meet individual needs and to tease these individual tasks out of more general tasks and therefore uh, uh, make both a contribution and a way of making money. Well, and I also hear, I hear, I hear you saying that ad hoc unbundling is not a good idea. You it's know? not a good idea. What you need to do is systematize what you're going to do. Think about it before. You have to build a mini system, a mini uh, a system of what I call uh, uh, like a form system. Or you have to think of the task, think of the workflow. It's a pro it's like a product. What you're doing is productizing a legal service and doing it in a way which is satisfying to the client. Uh, you know, there are lots of things that are services that have become more productized that nobody thought was possible. So, uh, you know, you have Zappos. Nobody thought you could buy your shoes online. You know, people thought you had to go into a shoe store and somebody had specialties, had to measure your foot. That's a service. Well, they converted that into a purely productized service. So you can get a lot of leverage if you can figure out a way to productize a service by adding digital technology to it because I see as a future that legal services, some legal services in the future will be not just a pure service, but they'll be a mix, a hybrid between a digital application and delete the service of a lawyer. And by combining those things, you create a sort of uh, managed productized service, which can get a lot of leverage for it because you can do this in volume and you could be the only game in town if you've done it in a way that has some proprietary aspects to it. Okay, so that sort of does answer the, the follow-up question I had, which, which was, does the high-tech lose the high-touch? 
Um, and you're basically saying, you know, if you, you can do, you could have both. Yeah, um, you need to have both. The, the, the real distinction here is to, is to build in both, that you want to build in both high tech and high touch. Now, we, we know that a, a pure on, online service is not going to be as rich as a face-to-face -face service in the office, but what you sacrifice for that, you pick up in terms of reach because the law firm now has the leverage. So, I mean, think of this. If you did a lot of work and you created this kind of service and all you did was see clients in your office one-on-one, -on -one, it wouldn't be very economically productive. But if you did this and you put it online because you're increasing reach, you can serve everybody in the whole state with your particular brand of a proprietary service. Uh, you know, and it, and it could be very specialized. It could be uh, just like uh, trademark infringement, or you know, it could be it could be an hour service. But when it's done right at the right price point, it leads to a volume business. Gotcha. So can a new lawyer or someone just out of law school going solo handle this? I mean, should this only be done by people that understand the law? or a practice to the, it the traditional way before you can create a system? Uh, uh, sometimes a fresh look at something with a fresh pair of eyes is healthy and a better way of being creative. I think you have to know the substance of the law in, the, in an area. You have to know something about a well, the steps that it takes to deliver legal services before you can break it down. But uh, I don't see that much of a disadvantage as just being a young lawyer. I think you can learn that, and if you bring a fresh pair of eyes, you're not going to be bounded by the older way of doing things. So I encourage younger lawyers to think about how to do this. I mean, this is where innovation comes from, thinking about things differently. And this is innovation. So what, what, what can law schools do to, uh, to get their students more prepared for uh, the world of unbundled uh, service delivery? I think law, law schools should be teaching kind of clinical courses and law practice management, which combines, uh, which is informed by learning a whole bunch of uh, information technology skills like databases and client management and legal service delivery. And well, to do those courses embedded in a kind of clinical experience where they're dealing with some Practice. I mean, it could be very. It could be a, a very healthy learning experience. For example, to have law students parse a document and create a, an automated document using any one of the tools that are available that Mark talked about last week. I mean, that's a challenging uh, uh, exercise anyway, intellectually. And uh -huh. uh, just having a taste of that can. Uh, I mean, I used to teach this in the University of Maryland Law School. It's it very gratifying. I have. Lawyers kind of contacted me eight years later. I said, you know, this really impacted the way I thought about law practice and had a real impact on what I'm doing now. Not everybody, but there's enough the people who did it, which showed me that this was really a good way to go. Oh yeah. So that leads to, you know, this is also if you're not a tech savvy person, you know, are there, isn't there naturally going to arise, or is there already a an industry of uh, websites and services that can help me set up an unbundled Practice. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I there are. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, here, here's one. Uh, let me, first of all, if you go to this is an offer. If you go to directlaw.com, anybody can register for a free trial. You don't even need a credit card. It's a learning experience, and and what it is is it automatically will set up for you in software what a client sees and what the lawyer sees to manage that client experience to an attorney dashboard. So if you just go to it and you see what it looks like, that that's a learning experience by itself. And I invite anybody who wants to do that. It, 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 the URL is just directlaw.com, and you'll see on the right, it'll say 30 day trial, and it's free, and anybody can go into it and learn it. Uh, that's, yeah, there it is. That's the first. You just go where it says 30 day free trial. And uh, that's a really good learning experience by itself. The second thing is the ABA in the Ethics 2020 uh, Commission has recommended a new comment that defines the competence of the lawyer, and it says that. Going forward, the ABA House of Delegates will probably approve it this summer. That lawyers are now expected to know the risks and benefits of, of using information technology as part of the definition of competence. That doesn't mean that you have to become a programmer, but you have to begin to go up the learning curve and understand how technologies inform the delivery of legal services. That's the first time they've ever really done this. Mm -hmm. And I believe that, you know, forgetting about law students, lawyers would come to me and say, I can't learn this. I said, well, look, if I can learn it, anybody can learn it. 
that it's really important to keep learning as a professional. What it really means to be a professional is to reinvent yourself every 10 years. And I expect that lawyers will simply have to learn what they need to know to operate in this environment. And if they don't, they don't deserve the title of being a professional. And now, because law is so much infused by information technology, having knowledge of information technology is part of the tools that you need to become and to be an effective attorney. And it's not a combat, and you don't have to be a programmer to do that, but if you can read and understand, you can learn how these technologies integrate and inform the delivery of legal services. Excellent. Uh, what about malpractice insurance? Is a well, you know, it hasn't been an, an issue. I've been, uh, my malpractice carrier said, you know, this is a, a law practice is a law practice, whether it's online or offline. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, we use uh, tools that are ethically compliant. So uh, sometimes you have to plan for other kinds of risks to make sure that the client that you're dealing with, if you're online, is actually the client that you're dealing with. But uh, I haven't seen malpractice as really a barrier, and I haven't seen the carriers with very few exceptions, the carriers have not acted in a way of not to endorse these concepts. And don't forget the rule structure on limited legal services. If you have a written agreement, if the scope is limited, all, uh, all the carriers uh, now recognize this as a new way of delivering legal services. So I, I don't see that as really a constraint. These, these, are questions, these are questions coming from the audience, right? Is that where this is coming from? Yes, I wrote a few of them, but um, I'm, I'm okay. mostly, I mean, there's enough good ones from the audience that I'm not, I don't have to dig into mine. Um, are there examples of law refundling with discrete services from other professions? And the example is uh, family lawyers offering services bundled along with uh, uh, psychological or social services? Probably not so uh, much yet, right? Well, well, yeah, but you, you do have things like physician's assistants, right? Oh. And what, you, what you have there is you have delegation and uh, the more discreet services offered by physician assistants, which are not offered by the doctor. So if you look at uh, other other kinds of professions where there's a heavier use of, parale of uh, paraprofessionals, you'll see uh, delegation of tasks. Uh, right, so you get your flu shot from the nurse, but yeah, uh, the correct. doc makes right. sure that... Uh, right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think there are other examples I could think about. I mean... I mean, certainly. Well, yeah, there are a lot of good. There are a lot of good examples. Uh, so, if you go to Charles Schwab and you're going to pay 895 to do your stock training, that's an unbundled transaction. Instead of going, what was then Merrill Lynch and paying $400 for a broker to exercise your transaction and paying full service. So, there are lots of examples economically in other service industries, which uh, uh, represent forms of unbundling and, and ways in which. You know, pricing uh, gets done. The, you know, in insurance and and in financial service industries. Uh, you know, that's a major f force for innovation and change in all those industries. It's to figure out how to strip out uh, costs which are not necessary for that essential do-it-yourself customer. So think about like do-it-yourself trading, or I, mean, I think that I can think of a lot of examples, but not right offhand. Maybe if no, I have no, a chance to write about, it, I'll do some more on your wiki. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Richard. We're we're running out of time, and I need to I need okay. a minute to uh, talk uh, homework uh, to everybody. That's um, fine. We will post all those questions on the wiki, and and uh, it's wonderful that you've offered to come back and answer. And and, and I'll, I'll also go through with uh, some of the answers that you gave, um, uh, you know, and try to uh, sort of summarize. So you're you're not alone in that process. Great. Thank all you right. very much. That's great. I'll just hang on for a minute while you do it. Thank you. You bet. So homework assignment four. Um, so it's a, it's a uh, there's two pieces here, and I'll and, uh, and and let me just go through the first part, which is um, uh, the first one. So um, so first, define two discrete tasks that could be unbundled from different areas of law practice. So so come up with just two examples. This is this is relatively straightforward. Um, although the goal here is for you to start thinking or or to think systematically about law practice and, and, and how you might take a particular legal service product and take it apart. Define a task that lends itself to being converted into a digital application. In other words, just because it's unbundled doesn't mean it's digital, and some unbundled services lend themselves better to a web-based or a digital uh, application, such as a, a smart, uh, an app 
or a website or some kind of downloadable program. Think about the first time you used like TurboTax or Tax Act or any of the tax preparation software. That was an unbundled service that you, prior to that, would have, if you wanted a professional to help you do it, you went to H&R Block or one of the other ones. And now you can do it with all sorts of advice and call-outs happening you know, inside of a piece of software. So list some of the risks, and I put at least three, that are involved with unbundled legal services. You know. And um, try to think of a digital application that could automate a legal task and bundled with legal advice be sold for a fixed fee. So what I'm trying to say is, uh, don't, and don't just use uh, Richard's excellent example of you know, a document with a, a attorney review. That's, that's, that's the easy one. Um, try, to, try to think of something else that, that someone would have to, uh, that someone could use online or in a digital application that would then re-engage with a lawyer you know, so, so that there's both an unbundled aspect and a uh, high, let's just say a high touch and a high tech aspect. All right, so that's your homework. Now I've added also a, uh, an extra credit, and it basically said, uh, look, uh, the, the unbundling or the limited service agreement uh, issues are, are state by state, and um, there are too many places on the web that I could find where, where there's uh, collections of links to those opinions and uh, to articles, blog posts, and things. And so um, if you want to get some extra credit or if you want to help us out, um, go to this page, which is on the wiki. And you know, as you find articles or, or opinions or things like that, and, and if they're state specific, um, put them underneath the particular state. I've uh, pre-filled this in with a list of state names. And if they're not state specific, then just include a link under the not state specific at the, at the top. All right, so that's the homework. Uh, you've seen the new badge. We're now about two minutes past, and so I think we're done. Thank you very much. It's been wonderful having you, and uh, look for you to join us again next week. Um, and so see you next week. Thanks. So